Welcome to part three, the final instalment of Cheap Old Road Bike into Fashionable Fixie, or something along those lines anyway. First up though, let's recap what we've done so far. In part one, I showed you this frame and exactly why I decided to go for it, the 1986 Peugeot Premier. Then in part two, I ran through all of these components just behind me and why I decided to go for those ones too. So today, it can only mean one thing, the build. Let's do it. Now I am going to warn you here, this video is quite long in length, but it is actually at the request of you, the keen viewers, because underneath the past couple of builds that I've done, you've all said, why don't you show it in all of its glory, every single component being fitted. So that is exactly what we have done. Now, I do appreciate that some of you may well want to skip forward to certain items being fitted. So if that is the case, we have linked to those exact timestamps in the description that you can find below this video. Right, first up then, let's start making this frame look more like a frame and fork. So by that, I mean it's time to actually add the forks on. So we need to fit the headset. So I've got here the crown race, so you can see it just there. And that's interference fit onto the actual fork crown. So it means it won't just slide on in place, it needs to be nicely well essentially hit into place so i'll place it on and here you can see i've got a drift and that one is specific again for this actual size of headset so it's one inch and then using the fork crown race system i just need to put that on there and then give it a sharp blow with a hammer making sure of course i don't trap my fingers or anything but you do want to make sure it goes on nice and straight so cover your ears this one gets a little bit loud Oops, there we are, the fork crane's on. Okay, let's put those headset cups into place. First up, I am just gonna put a little bit of grease around the inside of the head tube there, just to help those cups go in nice and smoothly. I prefer to fit the cups in as a pair. Some people like to put them in individually, but I've always been a fan of just putting them in as a pair for some reason. So let's have a do that. Also, I've put a little bit of grease inside here. There are already bearings in there. They are kind of sealed bearings. I don't really want to take them out and fiddle around too much. Like I said in the last episode, it is just a, a cheap headset that I'm putting into this one. I don't want to spend, spend a fortune on it. See how much I enjoy riding it first. We'll do the same on the upper cup too. We'll just put a little bit of grease in there. rub it around. You can always wipe away any excess right at the end. Okay, as you can see I put my gloves on for this one, it's a little bit messy, it can be at times. So we want to start, sometimes it depends on the actual bearing shapes and everything and the style of headset, they can be uh, directional, so an upper and lower um, sections of these fixed cups, but in this case they're not. You want to try and get them in as straight as possible to start with before you actually start pressing them in so they don't go uh, in oval or anything like that because you can actually warp the shape of the inside of the head tube when doing that. So let's put the lower one onto the actual guide before we can make, begin to tighten it into place. This lower one is quite, goes in quite a fair bit anyway, before it even starts to bite. Let's just tighten that up. Checking always to make sure it's going in absolutely straight. And then almost minimal effort on this one. case then of putting in the fork up through there we go putting on the first bit of crown uh, adjustable race on the top there I always like to put a touch of grease as you've noticed in one of my maintenance videos there's nothing worse than something getting stuck in place after many years and uh yeah, having the struggle to undo it. So, 
just tighten that on. See, a lot of people out there thought this was going to have a French diameter headset or French thread as well. But the good news is it didn't, which is very good news because trying to get things which are well modern and still work all right isn't that easy these days. So just do that by finger tight just to get it roughly where you want it. Now I know this headset isn't going to be the smoothest of things because I spent about five pounds on it so I'm not looking for Chris King style precision but I do want it to be, be all right for riding around town on so give it a bit of play there. A little, more. a little bit of play. It's not bad. So not the smoothest, you know, not ceramic bearings or anything like that. We don't get that for five pounds, but I think that will do the job. Yeah. Right, so now we need to put on, we've got a little washer here. You can see that little bit of extra material there. And well, that is actually gonna slot inside of the back of the uh, steerer tube on the fork where there's a little cutout. Now, not all forks have that, but loads of bikes from the 80s and 90s did. So we need to just make sure that lines up on the back of the actual steerer there. You can see there, hopefully you can see my little blue glove poking through. So we'll line that up and that's there. So it's not gonna move either way. It's just a handy little spacer. To be honest, I don't really know why they ever decided to do that, but they have plagued people in the past because if your fork steerer doesn't have one of those slots and you try and put it on, you could end up damaging the actual threads of the fork. Then we're gonna put a little bit more grease on, again, just on this locking nut. And I'm just gonna thread that on top of the actual steerer before locking the two together. So some of you may well remember a video I did recently on how the headsets work. And well, we had a traditional style headset like this, as well as the A-head style. And for these, of course, it means you need to use some special tools here. But what I'm gonna do is actually try and protect the paintwork of this headset a little bit, even though, like I've already said, it only costs a very small amount. So I'm just gonna slide over, like you just saw, that plastic bag, so I don't scuff it up. Handy little tip for you that, if you've got some nice components, you don't wanna get ruined. This one's not, this one's not that nice, but I still don't wanna ruin it though. So you wanna make sure when you're doing it up, of course you're not ruining the bearing tension or anything like that that you've already set. So it does take a little bit of toing and froing just to get it spot on and right. Oh, lovely. There's always a challenge on these on your best bike back in the 90s or well, if you had a setup like this to try and get the two nuts to line up perfectly. It was never as simple as it seemed. Never that straightforward. Right, jobs are good and on that. Bottom bracket next. So we're gonna add again a little bit of grease on to the actual thread here. In this case, the actual uh, fixed cup, or what used to be called the fixed cup, is built actually onto the side of the bottom bracket. Now, what is quite funny, some of these ones, you could actually put this bottom bracket into a vise and smack it off and put it on the other way around if you had a frame that was threaded in a different way and uh, you had some spare cups or anything like that, you could play around with them and get it to fit. You don't have to do that on this one. This has got British threads on it because it's actually a bike that was in the British market. So you wanna make sure obviously it threads on okay. If there is any resistance or anything like that, you could well be cross threading. But I've done a fair few of these in my time. So obviously you wanna get it torqued up to the correct amount. Now Shimano actually recommend 49 to 68 Newton meters. So I'm gonna be putting mine in at 60 because it's a good halfway house there. You can see it went in nice and easily. Obviously been cared for all right, or it's been chased out okay. So we'll just talk that up. There we are, that's talked up. It's just a case then of doing exactly the same thing 
on the other side. Again, applying plenty of grease on there. The last thing you want is a seized bottom bracket because they can be an absolute pain to get out. There we are, 60 Newton meters. Had a little workout for the day anyway. Time to fit the chain set onto that bottom bracket then. Now, some people, they tend to like to actually grease the splines of, or tapers rather, of one of these bottom brackets before fitting on the chain set. However, my personal preference is I don't like to do that. The reason being, if there is a slight difference in tolerances, I mean, it is an interference fit, but if it starts to get a little bit sloppy because the crank bolt works loose, that grease can work almost as a cutting agent and start to round off the insides of a chain set, which renders it useless. So, what I'm gonna do is, obviously this is perfectly clean, as is the inside of the crank arm, is place it on. But, I'm not gonna use the little Allen key bolts here that are supplied. The reason being, I don't like to put too much torque through them, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I prefer to actually use an old crank bolt first, like this use a thin washer as well behind it, then use a hex socket like this to actually tighten that up. Now, it only takes about 40 Newton meters to put one of these on, nice and tight onto the actual bottom bracket, but it's just something I've always decided to do and I'm, uh, well, I'm gonna stick by my guns with that. So we'll torque this bolt up before taking it out and then replacing it with the Allen key ones because they look really nice. Unless, of course, you've got some fancy dust caps on there, like the old Campagnolo ones, something like that. But we'll just tighten that up again with the handy torque wrench. Make sure I've got it in the right, right direction, yep. So we'll tighten it up, then remove it and refit those Allen key bolts and basically reverse the process on the other side. Right, so like I say, get that one out. And replace it, remembering of course that little washer, and replace it with the Allen key one. Do it fairly tight, it does have a little bit of sort of blue Loctite on there, but well, it's kind of like a thread locker, but just put in on some grease. You don't want any bolts to get stuck. I know I always say it, and you lot at home laugh, but I'm being serious. You don't want to get them stuck on there. Because once it's on, it shouldn't ever work its way loose anyway, the crank. That's where you need the special crank puller to actually get it off. But do them up fairly tight. I mean, that's nowhere near 40 Newton meters, because uh, believe me, I'd know about it. And it's just a case then, of repeating that exact same process on the other side. Of course, making sure that they are lined up 180 degrees to one another, because uh, otherwise you'd be pedaling around like a, like a clown or something like that. So I wanna make sure that we're all okay with that. All right, let's have a little play around then with the back wheel. So first up, we're gonna fit on the actual fixed sprocket. So you've guessed it, some more grease going on. We'll put that on the threads. And should be about right. I'm going to put the fixed sprocket on first. So as you can see, here it is. Threads on in a conventional way, so it tightens as you pedal. But something you've got to bear in mind here is that if you were to try and back pedal on a fixed wheel bike, well, that sprocket could come loosened. Obviously, that's not ideal. So we will tighten it up using chain whip here. Luckily, I've got an eighth of an inch one. If you haven't got one and you are using an eighth of an inch, a standard one will work, but you need to wrap it around a fair bit. Do it up as tight as you can. And to keep that sprocket in place, we are gonna actually put a lock ring onto the hub. Now, this tightens against the sprocket, meaning if you were to back pedal and try and un, uh, well, untighten, release that sprocket, you're not gonna be able to do so because you've actually got this working against it and the two forces just won't allow that. So then we'll use a bottom bracket tool, so an old adjustable cup one, to just fully torque it up. So we just wrong way, they do actually 
thread on in opposite directions. We just fully tighten that, put a little bit of force behind it, but enough <clears throat> to actually lock that in place. And of course the free wheel sprocket, again, use my favorite ingredient, a little bit of grease on the actual threads of the hub shell. Just make sure they've all got a little bit. It'll get pushed on as you actually tighten this free wheel sprocket into place. You remember in the last episode, I told you, you're gonna get two bikes for the price of one with this, because you've got a free wheel on one side and a fixed wheel on the other side. My personal preference has to be free wheel because well, you don't have to pedal around corners, no risk of grounding out if you're really going fast. But that there, you don't actually really have to tighten that on anymore because the force of when you're riding along, that will tighten it into position. But whilst we've got the chain whip out, we may as well just give it a gentle little bit of persuasion there too, just to save your legs doing the work. There we go. Whoa. Free hub, same check. It's starting to take a lot more shape now. And something to consider actually when putting wheels into a bike, which is the next step, is that sometimes it can be a little bit easier if the bike is actually on the floor. Uh, the reason being is that gravity can do its job and well, it can actually, the wheels themselves can find their way into the drop It's just a little bit easier. It's starting to take a lot more shape now, looking more and more like a bicycle, especially when I put the rear wheel in. Now, I did have a play around with the actual spacing at the rear, but because it uses cartridge bearings, it's not as easy as an old cup and cone one. But for around town and the lack of maintenance, it really, in my eyes, makes sense to have a good old cartridge sealed bearing to work with. So we're just gonna loosely tighten up this wheel into place so that, well, we can start making the bike look more and more like a bike. Now, the reason I say about playing around with the chain line and everything is you want it to be almost as straight as possible, really. So the chain itself is not running at any unusual angles or anything. But believe it or not, I've seen riders in the Olympics, World Championships and all sorts using terrible chain lines and they've never had a chain dislodge. Uh, the, the way we used to actually on track bikes years ago was set it up and then essentially pick the bike up and shake it around a lot and see if the chain fell off. I've never had one fall off because generally you have enough tension there and as long as it's not too tight, well, it's gonna be running oh so smooth. Now, the reason I say too tight is because unless you are buying very, very top end components, the chain rings and sprockets aren't necessarily that round. So inevitably there is a tight spot when you ride unless of course, like I say, you do use that really top end components. In my case here, I haven't used that, so there would be a tight spot. So we are gonna have a chain which has a slightly looser spot, I guess, at one point than another, but we'll come on to that shortly. Time to fit the pedals then, because it's gonna make the next step just a little bit easier. Remember, of course, pedals are left and right thread specific, although it's not that easy to actually remember which direction if, unless you're fitting them on a regular basis. And you'll be pleased to know as well, I've pre-greased the threads, yep grease again. So you want to make sure it goes in there again nice and smoothly. You wouldn't be the first person to cross thread a pedal thread and believe me I've worked with a few people over the years who've done it and uh, I've given them the right old ear bashing as well. So you want them to be nice and tight in there. You don't ever want a pedal to come loose because you will know about it. Again just make sure that you don't accidentally slip and uh, catch your knuckles on the chain ring because believe me I've got a lot of skin missing from my knuckles, hence the gloves. And then the other one, straight in. Some pedals, of course, they don't have a flat on here and they only tighten up using an Allen key, which can make it a little bit easier, but can also make it, well, well it can give you skinless knuckles. My cheap and cheerful pedals, they'll do the job. Around town, I'm stopping and starting racing away from the traffic lights or something like that. Right, let's get that chain fitted. This, I think you're gonna love. For the chain, I contacted KMC, who are a leader in chains in my opinion, and they sent me in one of these cool night chains. They even asked me, why do you want those? We didn't sell very many of those. And I said, well, it's for this bike and it looks pretty different, let's face it. Has a flat top on it, not that dissimilar to the new SRAM Axis chains, but importantly, it's an eighth of an inch pitch, and get this, it's also got half links. So you know normally when you take apart a chain, you have to take apart two, remove two links to join it back together. With this, 
you don't, you only have to take out one. So therefore you can get a better chain line on a bike like this, or better chain length, sorry. So you don't have to worry too much about the length of the dropouts, which of course is pretty critical because on a road frame like this, they aren't that long, as opposed to a track specific frame or a fixed gear specific frame that have long old dropouts for you to have quite a lot of room to be able to play around with. So for this, we're just gonna fit it. And luckily the joining pin is very similar to that of Shimano where you fit it through, snap it off. And uh, once I've actually got it in place, I can then retention the back wheel so I can just undo those nuts and just pull it back and get that chain nice and correct in regards to its tension. So when it comes to chain length, you can see, like I've said before, I've got the wheel quite far forward in the dropout. And I'm gonna pull the chain taut. Now I'm not gonna go for this link here. The reason being is if I do that, I'm not gonna have enough room really safely to have the wheel in place. So instead, I'll go for the one just behind it. So that one there, so I know that's the one. So before I forget and go and grab the chain tool, I'm just gonna count, it's the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, th it's the 14th. So I know it's the 14th one there I want to do, and then I can rejoin the chain in that position, undo slightly the tension of the nuts here on the rear, and just pull the wheel back in place and get that chain nice and correctly uh, tensioned up. And then we can go about the rest of our business. And just pop out the rest of that link. Seems a shame to waste this nice looking chain. Big fan of this. I once had a white BMX chain on my track bike, everyone laughed at me. Especially as I fell off really badly that day as well. It didn't help my cause. Right, okay, let's put that joining pin in before snapping it off. Sometimes it might be a little bit easier to actually not do it whilst it's on the uh, chain and sprocket because you might not have that much room to actually be able to play around with there. As you can see, handy little tool you could use is a bit of a, an old coat hanger or something like this. Now at the moment you can see it does look a little bit loose, but believe me, once I pull that wheel back into the dropout, it will make the world of difference. But for this, I will actually take it just off and rest it, just to give me a little bit more freedom really to work with it. So you can see here, there's that pin. The pointy end will go through first, or slightly chamfered edges, I guess. That will go through, leading the way, and then I snap it off when it comes through, uh, leaving the shorter end inside of it. Just like what happens on Shimano chains, for instance. It's just a job when you want about three or four hands. But once it goes in, you can see it's nice and easy. Then you can probably put it in place just to make this next step a little bit easier, really. We could even play around now with that wheel just to make sure that the chain, we'll do the final chain adjustments at the end, but I just wanted to make sure that that chain was okay. If you have a little bit of room like that, it's never gonna come off, believe me, it's never gonna come off. Not even over the Carrefour de Labra or the Forest of Arenberg or whatever cobbled classics that uh, takes your fancy. So, just a case then of lining up that chain, of course. Not that easy with one of these because you can't access it, which I've just remembered because of the flat bit. So you're going to have to go from the top. I've never had to do this ever in my life. Who knows if I ever will again. Uh, if I go around the other way, of course, I can, I can do that. I just need to have enough room. <laughs> just goes to show I obviously always join the chain on the bottom, never on the top. There we are. Right. Push that pin through. It's funny how used we get to uh, using joining pins these days. Or rather split links, very handy, but that's nearly through. So there we are, it's through on the other side. So you can see there then, got that little bit. And this was always quite unnerving really. When Shimano first launched, their version of this back, I think it was with the Hyperglide chain, so the HG models, I think the Uniglide ones, the UGs were just a simple pin that went in and out, much like an old Sedis chain. I couldn't believe that you had to just snap something off. I thought, this is very strange. Either way, it is the way you do it. So we just snap that off, it takes a little bit of force, get that out, and look, there's the old bit. 
or where's, there's the new bit which you don't use. But it's more of like a guide really and just make sure that you get everything a-okay. So you can see there it's got a different appearance to the rest, it is slightly darker. But yeah, it's nice and flexible, it's going to do the job putting the watts through that. So look at that. Beautiful. Probably get that chain just a little bit tighter again. Just, uh, but yeah, you'll see, you will see there'll be, there'll be different parts of this chain which are tighter than the rest. But it's funny, some, some riders, I used to mechanic a couple of six day riders and some of them like to have a really loose chain on their bikes, on their track bikes, and others want them really tight. In the end, you used to tell them just to do it themselves if they weren't happy. <laughs> They'd always come creeping and crawling back though. All right, let's have a go then. It's just tightening up this, getting exactly how we want it. It is a case often of toing and froing with the actual pressure. But too tight and you will know about it and you don't want it too tight. Too loose, of course, like I said before, it will come off. That's too loose. So we will just get this spot on. You can see now I've put the front wheel in place and it's time to actually get our steering sorted out. So the stem, the traditional quill style stem, that's going to be fitted into the steerer tube here. So once again, you know the regime by now, I reckon. I'm going to put some of my favourite stuff, a bit of grease on the actual stem and also down there on the expander bolt too. These used to have such a tendency to become stuck in a, in a frame or rather forks. I remember a friend of mine putting his forks in a, the grate of a drain, a roadside drain, trying to bend the bars out of place and end up snapping his forks. His father gave him a right telling off that night. Oh, it wasn't me by the way. I ruined a back wheel when I was 14. That's, uh, that's about as far as I got. Right, so we'll put it in. Doesn't have to worry too much about how lined up it is, but get it in the ballpark place then you can always adjust it later once you actually sat over the bike and you can get your eye in so to speak. This stem it is like an old-fashioned looking thing but it can't be that old because it does in fact have on the top of it a torque setting and it's 22 newton meters so here's one I prepared earlier and we'll just tighten that up just in case we forget to straighten it further down the line. You can see I didn't really do up the front wheel either there, so it just had a little slip out of place, but let's just do that up. So you forget how tight you actually have to do up these things. And I forget, that's, oh, there we are, <laughs> exactly right. Good, there we go. Let's see, I do like a stem like this. I reckon it's gonna be slammed all the way down, trying to look as cool as possible. Then the bars, they'll simply slide in before we'll do up this bolt on the bottom there too. Not sure if this one actually has a, it does 10 Newton meters, so there we are again. Is it a six or a five? It's a six, that's handy. So we'll tighten that up again into about the right sort of place where you want these bars to be fitted. So they are a riser bar or that sort of thing, so we'll put them. There's some handy indentations as well on these bars, so you can get them lined up almost perfectly in the front. Tell you what, it's a lot easier putting these bars in than the old drop handle bars. You just always get a little bit sad when you buy a pair and you fit them in there for the first time, you'd end up scuffing them. I mean, I know they used to get covered up with the bar tape and everything, but still, it was ever so sad, especially if you'd saved up all your paper own money to buy them. All right. Anyway, I should focus on this, shouldn't I? Enough tales of my childhood. Again, I wasn't that boy who uh, put the forks in the drain. That was my friend. I'm not going to give his name away, Hobbit. Right, there we are, that's looking about right. So, just do them up nicely. There we go, lovely jubbly. I'll take that wheel out actually now, just for the moment. Right, let's put some brake levers on. 
before we uh, put the calipers in place. So where do we know exactly where to fit our brake levers then? Well, I'll come on to that in a moment, but just to give you a little bit of advice here, most brake levers are left and right hand specific. How do we know though? Well, luckily you've got manufacturer's logos on there like that. Although some brands are actually reversible, so you can use them on either side, which is really handy, let's face it. But in the case of this one, we've even got an L H just there stamped on it and the other one has got an RH so if in doubt have a little look around but where are we going to fix it then well let's take our grip which you will see attached in a moment or two and you're going to hold that exactly where it would be and then using something sharp something at least that can score just very gently the metal you only want a very slight little mark of the on the handlebar just use something like that then that will give you the position then so you can simply slide that on and then clamp it into place, or at least loosely clamp it so it's held there and uh, it's not floating around in no man's land because that won't do you any favours. Ultimately though, it's likely once you set it up, you will want to move it around slightly just into your preferred position and also the direction of the handlebars too. But just for the first fix, if you like, that's what we're going to do here. And then the right hand one, in my case, is going to be the exact same process. I mentioned in the last video, I had a good little hack to get some grips on easier. People previously have used such things as saliva or even washing up liquid. However, the washing up liquid theory doesn't tend to work very well when you encounter rain because it ends up with the grip becoming a bit like a motorbike throttle and not staying in place. So for this, I've got myself some hairspray. That's right, I've raided the GCN makeup wardrobe and uh, well, I've got this. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll just simply spray some onto the actual handlebar or alternatively, you can spray inside of the grip and then you can simply press it into place. And once the actual liquid within the hairspray evaporates, it means that these stay nicely and stuck in place. Look at that. How easy did that go on? You have to use a little bit more than what you probably think you do, but yeah, that will soon be rock solid and stuck in place. No motorbike throttle on this bad boy. Oh no. If you don't put enough on, maybe sometimes you have to put it inside both the handlebar, sorry, rather both on the handlebar itself, as well as inside of the grip, just to give it something to sort of work together. Someone's not going to be very happy. I've used up all their uh, hairspray. Sorry, Lloydie. There we go. Just now, look at that. Like a dream. Oh, yes. I'm starting to like the look at this. Easy rider. Right, let's put those brake calipers on, cable it up, and then one final little hack of the day. Time now to fit the brake calipers onto the bike and you can see they are slightly different in that there's a central fixing bolt which runs through them and there's a shorter one and a longer one. Now the shorter one goes on the rear of the bike because all it has to go through is a very thin tube on the brake bridge or what is called the brake bridge and then the front one is longer because it goes through the fork crane which again is slightly bigger in depth. Now fitted onto this bolt which runs through, so it's like the mounting bolt if you like, you've got these washers that have a slightly sort of wavy uh, internal to them. The reason behind that is so it can match up with the uh, sort of semi-circle like shape of the fork crane there. So it's gonna give you a nice surface to actually be tightened onto. And you've got another one which fixes onto the rear of the fork crane there too, and then a washer. Now this, this uh, hex nut here is not what we saw commonly on road bikes because normally we see an allen key bolt which is fitted into a recess on the back of the fork and the brake bridge but on these old bikes they don't have that. So there is a nylon insert inside of that so it's not going to rattle itself loose or shake loose. Of course brakes are a pretty important part of the bicycle but I am just going to put a dab of my favourite thing there, grease, on the back before tightening it away because you don't want something like this to get rusty and stuck in place because remember the wheels throw up all that road debris and grime and that can cause corrosion. Nobody likes corrosion do they? So I just want it to be roughly central and then because there's a micro adjust screw on this caliper then you can line up 
your brake pads before we go ahead and fit the cables. Now the, the rear is the exact same. Brake pads normally have a directional indicator on them, so you know that they're going in the right direction. Of course, these are a one-piece pad. You can get pads which slot into a shoe, and they need to have the closed part of the shoe facing forward so that when you brake, the pads don't slide out. So we'll just gradually get that into position. So you can just hold the calipers in and just line it up like so. Of course, we'll fine tune the actual brake caliper position once we've got the cables in place. It's now time to route the rear brake cable. Now it's internally routed here, it goes through the top tube there, and then leaves it just here. Now sadly, there's not an internal routing uh, sort of channel inside of that tube. So instead, you actually have to thread it through. And um, well, if you watched my recent video on how to, uh, oh, it came straight out. Now that wasn't meant to happen in this video, but it did, believe it or not, come straight out but it's not gonna happen again. So I can actually use this special tool, which I've made out of an old uh, break out of cable. So you can see it there. I've pulled it, it's nice and spirally shaped, and it's got like a little picky end on it. So I've got it in there. It's simply a case of going around, trying to look for it, and hook it out. So you want to essentially put that inside, try and find it. Normally you'll feel like, a little bit of tension. So the cable has a mind of its own almost. But you can hook it out using this. Now sadly, on this frame, you can't even get your finger inside of the top tube to try and direct it at all. So you really do have to sort of do your best and try and see it before hooking it out. It's not going to plan today, but I will get it. Where there's a will, there's a way. Alright, I can see it now. So let's get that, try and direct it out. There we go. There we are. That is lucky. Now the reason I put through this cable first is that trying to get an outer cable through there will not be the easiest thing. The reason being it is very, very close uh, diameter to that of the outer cable. So probably about six millimeters, maybe seven at the very most. So we're gonna use this, first of all, as a guide. So with that in place, that's not gonna move anywhere, that's not gonna go anywhere. If in doubt, you could easily tape it so it's not gonna move. But then we can grab some of our trusty outer cable and measure how much you need. So, got a couple of different lengths here. Of course, the shorter one will be for the front caliper, which is gonna be oh so simple. Compared to, the, compared to the rear. But we'll use the, the length of rear first of all. Of course, they might be the same size, but no, there we are. There's the rear one. So we'll get that, grab cable cutters, wherever I've dropped them, there we are. And then measure that. Now I like to have a right-hand rear brake, and well, at least we are putting brakes on this fixie, or fixed wheel bike, I should call it. So. It's a case really, I like to always have the bars turned almost as far as, well sort of beyond 90 degrees really, so you've got a good loop, so that if you do have to go anywhere, that's gonna be all right. So you know that that's the length, run it along, and then give yourself enough for a nice little curve. And well, you're gonna have decent rear brake. So we can cut that, we can ferret, we can, Thread it, then over this outer, uh, over the inner cable, back through, and then up, and everything is fine. Make sure when you are cutting cable ends, you want to get them as round as possible. Just check that out. You see that? How round it is inside. So for that, you want something like an old biro end or something like that, or a little pick. Just put it inside of the end and you can just enlarge in that hole. I'll show you exactly what I mean on the uh, rough edged one. So I'm now gonna thread the cable inside of the outer. And what you don't wanna happen here 
is for it not to go through, but it will, because as long as you push that cable through on one end, you can gradually start to feed it through all the way and it will pop out the other end like so, like magic. Imagine all the time you've wasted in the past trying to do that. Now, giving you a little hack. Right, so we've got that there. What we can do now is actually take out the uh, inner cable. Because we've got that outer cable through, we are fine and dandy almost. So we can now go about putting some ferrules on the end of these cables and also shortening that length. You don't want to cut it too short to start with because, well, you're going to be lumbered then when it comes to your braking capability and strength. You just don't want that sort of thing to be compromised. So really, you want to have it, so it takes a nice, nice route. Something like that, that's all right, if you ask me. You can tell actually this is one built for the UK because normally your brake lever would be for the rear would be on the left hand side. I like to have mine on the right, like I've already said, and that would just give you a smoother routing. Remember, this bike did come with drop handlebars, so it would have gone over and around and in like that. Whereas this routing is probably not quite as good as it could be, but well, it is certainly up to the job. So we got that now. It's just a case of cutting that cable a little bit shorter there at the rear and then putting on those ferrules before threading the cable all the way through and hooking it up. So we'll put these ferrules just on the end there. The reason I like to use these is that they provide a really firm surface. When you pull the brake lever, the cable can't move any further. It can't compress any more. Uh, remember that brake cables have got some compression within them, the outer cables. That's why they're bound spirally, as opposed to a derailleur cable, which has lengthway strands, which make it, and obviously those index gear shifts, absolutely perfect. So I'll just put one on the end of the bike too. Then we'll feed the cable through, that inner cable, tighten it up, and we'll just do exactly the same on the front caliper. I like this. I like it a lot. So what we can do is actually start off if we're using a pair of flat bar levers like these, because you don't actually need to put the barrel end so that you can thread it all the way through near enough and then find the uh, cable holder, if you like, this like little bit of kit there, thread that through. And then thanks to the way that these uh, the barrel adjuster on the lever has a little slot there. You can see you can line it up with another one that you turn. You can line them all up and you can just slot that in and out. So if someone does want to get on this and they like to have the brakes around the other way, it's so easy for them just to swap them around from side to side. In fact, Doddy from GMBN, he had to do that recently. He borrowed my very old mountain bike and I had them set up the other way and I said, oh, I'm really sorry, mate. And then he reminded me that we could just do that. That's how long it was since I last rode my mountain bike. It was in the loft for about 15 years. All of that aside, let's hook up the, uh, the rear cable there, and then we'll just do the front one too. So I like to grab the caliper in from side to side, push both brake pads against the sidewalls of the rim, and then tighten up that clamp bolt on the brake cable. Give it a few pulls. Seems to be working all right. Give it a few sharp pulls, just to try and stretch the inner brake cable a little bit. They do stretch a tiny amount, and also try and get those, it also helps get those ferrules really well planted on the end of the outer cables. I always like to then put the barrel adjusters all the way back in, so that when those cables do gradually stretch a little bit over time and over use, you can just wind them out a little bit and get a little bit more tension on those cables. But this seems to be all okay. Pull it through again, just to give it a little bit more. Sometimes you can do it too much, like, like now. That's a little bit too much. I've just got to loosen it off a tad. But yeah, you get the idea, I'm sure. Remember that dilemma last week when I told you about the 24 millimeter diameter seat tube? Oh yes, that one plagued me for probably about half an hour before I thought to myself, why don't you just hack it? Oh, so that's what I've done. Bought myself a 23.4 millimeter seat post, but if you look at it, it goes inside of there. That, that's not very good, is it? 
you know, you can tighten up that, that uh, seat clamp bolt, but it's very likely you're just gonna crush the back of the frame and that's not good news because ultimately that could lead to a crack. So what have I decided to do here? I've decided the good old fashioned shimming it out with a bit of aluminium can. Other drinks are available by the way, or other types of can, but really you wanna get yourself enough so you can give at least 360 degrees worth of coverage inside of there, so you've got an equal clamping force all the way around the diameter, or circumference rather, of the actual seat post. So I'm gonna use this slightly thinner one, you can see here, so it's not quite as deep, but it does go all the way around. Now, if you really wanted to, you could measure it perfectly and make sure that, well, you had the correct amount of overlap all the way around, so you had 720 degrees or 360 degrees worth of coverage. I'm not really gonna go down that route because I think once it's in there, it'll be a-okay. So what we're gonna do is wrap it up nice and tightly like this, and then kind of let loose of it a little bit, put it back around the seat post, and then wrap it up again as tight as you can. Make sure, of course, there's no sharp edges on the can. I've seen World Tour, Mech <laughs> I've seen World Tour Mechanics do this before on a uh, Friday night before the Tour de France start when they had a problem with a slipping seat post on a rider's bike. So you wanna make sure it goes in there okay. So you can see it's starting to go in. Now, when you've got something like this, of course, if you add grease into the mix, it could be slightly more problematic. And you know, you wanna make sure things like this don't happen. So just check that out there. You can see it's got caught on the back of the seat tube where the slot is, and it's just started to cut it up a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is actually just trim that off. And hopefully it will still be enough. Yeah, I've still got 360 all the way around, and hopefully it'll be thick enough. Otherwise, I'll have to drink another one of these and uh, I'll certainly have wings then, won't I? Right, let's see what we can do. Let's get that in there. Believe it or not, this does work. What the designer of this bicycle was ever thinking putting a 24 millimeter seat post in there, I don't know. I guess they were thinking, well, when it comes to them needing to get a new seat post, they won't be able to, they have to buy themselves a new bike. But uh, how I've cursed that person over the last seven days. Right, there we are, it's in there now. Still a little bit loose. To be honest, I'm gonna get myself another can and give that a bit more of a wrap because I'm just not quite comfortable with that amount of sloppiness inside of that seat tube. There we go. What you want to try and do as well is, is not lose it down the seat tube. So get your saddle height about right and then get it all there in place. Grab your Allen key or your spanner. Hopefully no one else out there has this same sort of problem as what I have. But if you do, you want to hold it so it doesn't actually fall down inside of the seat post. Now the reason I use aluminium, something like that, it's so thin, easy to work with. People in the past, they've used things like very thin bits of plastic, but they become so uh, thin, basically, when you apply more and more pressure, whereas the aluminium doesn't have quite the amount of uh, compression. So that's why it's really good to use it. Uh, alternatively, someone recently asked, actually, in one of the tech clinics, can they use some insulation tape in there instead of fibre grip or something like that, and also to stop galvanic corrosion. I've heard of people as well using gaffer tape, insulation tape, that sort of thing to act as a shim, but don't go and do that. But look, look at that, <coughs> that's nice and firm. That's not gonna go anywhere, I hope not anyway. It shouldn't do, I've done it before in the past, and like I say, I've seen all manner of people using bits of, bits of aluminium can for things. Now, just gonna put the saddle on and we are done. There we are, now it's just a case of fitting on this saddle. Like I said in the last episode, not sure how long it will stay on, but it's certainly all right for an interim bit of kit. Just need to try and get it in the fiddly sort of micro adjust clamp here. I'll work it from the other side, it tends to be a little bit easier. And then it's a case of leveling everything out. So remember, we still need to line up the handlebar stem to make sure it's perfectly straight in line with the front wheel. Also, the angle of the handlebars not to mention the brake levers too. So once it's out of the stand, it's much easier to do that because of course you are generally on a level surface. Let me know though about this video and what you've thought about it. And in fact, the whole series, I would love to know. Let me know down there in the comments section. And what would you like to see me tackle next? Nothing too fancy, nothing too wild, nothing too outrageous. 
I'm not a legendary inventor such as Isambard Kingdom Brunel, a very local legend to the offices here, but do get stuck into the comments section below because I'm sure you will. And now for two more great videos, part one, click just down here, and part two, just on the saddle.